Welcome back to Van Zulu. We're on chapter 37, experienced well-being. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. So I'm pretty much happy. And so, you know, the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Chapter 37, experienced well-being. <clears throat> when I became interested in the study of well-being about 15 years ago, I quickly found out that almost everything that was known about the subject drew on the answers of millions of people to minor variations of survey questions, which was generally accepted as a measure of happiness. The question is clearly addressed to your remembering self, which is invited to think about your life. All things considered, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Having come to the topic of well-being from the study of the mistaken memories of colonoscopies and painfully cold hands, I was naturally su suspicious of global satisfaction with life as a valid measure of well-being. As the remembering self had not proved to be a good witness in my experiments, I focused on the, well on the well-being of the experiencing self. I proposed that it made sense to say that Helen was happy in the month of March if she spent most of her time engaged in activities that she would rather continue than stop. Little time and situations she wished to escape and very important and very important because life is short. Not too much time in a neutral state in which she would not care either way. There are many different experiences we would rather continue than stop, including both mental and physical pleasures. One of the examples I had in mind for the, for a situation that Helen would wish to continue is total absorption in a task which may highly oh my god Tsk Tsentimihaili calls flow I'm sorry if I butchered your name um, calls flow a state that some uh, some artists experience in their creative moment creative moments and that many other people achieve when enthralled by a film a book or a crossword puzzle uh, interruptions are not welcome in any of these situations. I had also memories of happy early childhood in which I was always cry when my mother came to tear me away, to tear me away from my toys, to make, to take me to the park, and cried again when she took me away from the swings and the slide. The resistance to interruption was a sign I had been having a good time both with my toys and with the swings. I proposed to measure to measure Helen's objective happiness precisely as we assess the experience of two colonoscopy patients by evaluating a profile of the well-being she experienced over successive moments of her life. In this, I was following Edgeworth's hedonometer, I mean it's hedonometer method of a century earlier. In my initial enthusiasm for this approach, I was inclined to dismiss Helen's remembering self as an error-prone witness to the actual being of her experiencing self. I suspected this position was too extreme which it turned out to be, but it was a good start. Experienced well-being. I assembled a dream team that included three other psychologists of different specialties and one economist, and we set out together to, be, to develop a measure of the well-being of the experiencing self. A continuous record of experience was unfortunately impossible. A person cannot live normally while constantly reporting her experiences. The closest alternative was experience sampling, a method that that we had named Tsitsik, I think it's, Tsikcent Mihaly had invented. Technology has advanced since its, first, it, it's, since its first uses. Experience sampling is now implemented by programming an individual cell phones to beep or vibrate at random intervals during the day. The phone then presents a brief menu of questions about what the respondent was doing and who was with her when she was interrupted. The participant is also shown rating skill to report the intensity of various feelings, happiness, tension, anger, worry, engagement, physical pain, and others. Experience sampling is expensive and burdensome. Although there's less disturbing than most people initially expect, answering the question takes very little time. A more practical, a more practical alternative was needed, so we developed a method that we called the Day Reconstruction Method, DRM. We hoped it would approximate the results of experience sampling and provide additional information about the way people spend their time. Participants, all women in the early studies, were invited to a two-hour session. We first asked them to, re to relive the precious day in detail, breaking it up into episodes like scenes in a film. Later, they answered menus of questions about each episode based on the experience sampling method. Based on the experience sampling method. They selected activities in which they were engaged from a list and indicated the one to which they paid most attention. They also listed the individuals they had been with and rated the intensity of several feelings on separate zero six to scale. Zero, the absence of the feeling, six, most intense feeling. Our method drew on evidence that people who are able to retrieve 
a past situation in detail are also uh, able to relive the feelings that accompanied, accompanied it. Even experiencing their earliest physiological indications of emotion, we assume that our participants would fairly accurately recover the feeling of prototypical moment of the episode. Several comparisons with experience sampling confirm the validity of the DRM, the uh, day reconstruction method. Because the participants also reported the times at which episodes began and ended, we were able to compute a duration-weighted measure of their feelings during the entire working day. Longer episodes counted more than short episodes in our summary measure of daily effect. Uh, our questionnaire also included measures of life satisfaction, which we interrupted as the satisfaction of the remembering self. We used the DRM to study the determinants of both emotional well-being and life satisfaction in several thousands, in several thousand women in the United States, France, and Denmark. The experience of a moment or an episode is not easily represented by a single happiness value. There are many variants of positive feelings, including love, joy, engagement, hope, amusement, and many others. Negative emotions also come in many varieties, including anger, shame, depression, and loneliness. Although positive and negative emotions exist at the same time. It is possible to classify most moments of life as ultimately positive or negative. We could identify unpleasant episodes by comparing the ratings of positive and negative adjectives. We call an episode pleasant if a negative feeling was assigned a higher rating than all positive feelings. We found that American women spend about 19% of the time in an unpleasant state, somewhat higher than French women 16% or Danish women 14%. We call the percentage of time that an individual spends in an unpleasant state the U-index. For example, an individual who spent four hours of a 16-hour waking day in an unpleasant state would have a would have a U index of 25%. The appeal of a U index of a U index is that it's based not on a rating scale but on an objective measurement of time. Interesting. So if the U index for a population drops from 20 to 80 to 18 percent, you can infer that the total time that the population spent in emotional discomfort or pain has diminished by tenth by a tenth. A striking observation was the extent of inequality in the distribution of emotional pain. About half our participants reported going through an entire day without experience an unpleasant episode. On the other hand, a significant minority of population experienced considerable emotional distress for much of the day. It appears that a small fraction of the population does most of the suffering, whether because of physical or mental illness and unhappy uh, temperament, or the misfortunes or the misfortunes and personal and tragedies in their life. A U index can also be computed for activities. For example, we can measure the proportion of time that people spend in a negative emotional state while commuting, working, or interacting with their parents, spouses, or children. For 1,000 American women in a Midwestern city, uh, uh, U-Index can also be computed for activities. For example, we can measure the proportion of time that people spend in a negative emotional state while commuting, working, or interacting with their par uh, parents, spouses, or children. For 1,000 American women in a Midwestern city, the U-Index was 29% for the morning commute, 27% for work, 24% for childcare, 18% for housework, 12% for socializing, 12% for TV watching, and 5% for sex. The year index was higher by about 6% on weekdays than it was on weekends, mostly because on weekends people spend less time in activities they dislike and do not suffer the tension and stress associated with work. The biggest surprise was the emotional experience of the time spent with one's children. Surprise was the emotional experience of, oh, sorry, which for American women was slightly less enjoyable than doing housework. Here we found one of the few contrasts between French and American women. French women spend less time with their children but enjoy it more. Perhaps because they have more access to childcare and spend less of the afternoon driving children to various activities. Uh, I think, you know what I think that is? I think that has to do with the less is more. So the less you spend time, the more intense of emotion it is. Whereas if you keep on getting the same thing, like a, like a gift, if you kept on getting multiple gifts at the same time and you kept getting them every day, you kind of diminished the reward to yourself, interestingly enough, because it's just now standard, it's constant. Whereas if you have it very less, I would assume that you would have a more powerful experience emotionally with the kids. So less is more. 
An individual's mood at any moment depends on her temperament and overall happiness, but emotional well-being also fluctuates considerably over the day and the week. The mood of the moment depends primarily on the current situation. Mood at work, for example, is largely unaffected by the factors that influence general job satisfaction, including benefits and status. More important are situational factors such an as an opportunity to socialize with co-workers, exposure to loud noise, time pressure, a significant source of negative effect, and the immediate presence of a boss in our first study, the only thing that was worse than being alone. Attention is key. Our emotional state is largely determined by what, by what we attend to. And we normally focused on our current activity and immediate environment. There are, there are exceptions where the quality of subject experience is dominated by recurrent thoughts rather than by the events of the moment. When happily in love, we may feel joy even when caught in traffic, and, even, and if grieving, we may remain depressed when watching a funny movie. In normal circumstances, however, we draw pleasure and pain from what is happening at the moment. If we intend to, it, to get pleasure from eating, for example, you must notice that you are doing it. We found that French and American women spent about the same amount of time eating, but for French women, eating was twice as likely to be focal as it was for American women. The Americans were far more prone to combine eating with other activities, and their pleasure from eating was correspondingly diluted. These observations have implications for both individuals and society. The use of time is one of the areas of life over which people have some control. Few individuals can few individuals can will themselves to have a sunnier disposition, but some may be able to arrange their lives to spend less of their day commuting and more time doing things they enjoy with people they like. The feelings associated with different activities suggest that another way to improve experience is to switch time from passive leisure, such as TV watching, to more active forms of leisure, including socializing and exercise. From the social perspective, improved transportation for the labor force, availability of childcare for working women, and improved socializing opportunities for the elderly, for the elderly, uh, elderly. Uh, may be relatively efficient ways to reduce the U index of a society. Even a reduction by 1% would be a significant achievement amounting to millions of hours of avoided suffering. Combined national surveys of time, use and of experience while being can inform social policy in multiple ways. The economist on our team, Alan Kruger, took the lead in an effort to introduce elements of this method into national statistics. Okay, well, I think what's interesting about our pain is that it kind of motivates us to get out of it, you know. So like our suffering, we would motivate ourselves in order to get rid of the suffering. And then what happens usually if people, you know, get super suicidal and depressed, they would they are constantly in that state and therefore they don't know what to do and they try they don't know what how to get out of it. So which is interesting is that yes, that is true that people suffer, but the question is uh it can be motivating, but it also can be demotivating, determined, determined by how much uh, uh, is the information or the emotional uh, feelings that you get during the day. And what's also interesting is that maybe what should motivate you is what information you have at hand that reminds you constantly of maybe making the U index better or per se dec to, to decrease the U index. I think maybe the information, as long as you have really good information about yourself in front of you, you should be okay. You should be fine. You should understand like, oh, why am I feeling like this? Why? Because a lot of people tend to uh, be extremely subjective with on things and they create stories in their heads and they tend to um, make things a little bit crazy. They, 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 they make themselves crazy. In a way, I mean, that's a very pseudo way of saying, but what happens is they provide themselves with information that uh, gives them a increasingly demotivation, uh, gives them paranoia, it, you know, and tends to um, give this ideolo ideological idea of who they think they are when it's not the case. I mean, that's a long other story of defining. I think you get to choose once you understand how to control the environment and that perspective. So, the answer to this is probably keep the correct information in front of you in order to, for you to become what you want to be, in order what you want to choose to be. And while also that could be a little bit hypocritical in the sense because what makes us decide what we want to be, that is the case of, you know, you know, everyone wants to have a Bugatti like Andrew Tate, but I think the case is that's obviously from a young state, you want more resources, 
young state like as a young state of mind is that you want everything obviously um so that's more of a survival instinct than a uh and no, it's just a more of a survival instinct anyway i'm going to continue with this but Measures of experience bar being are now routinely used in large-scale national surveys in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And the Gallup board poll has extended these measurements to millions of respondents in the United States and in more than 150 countries. The polls elicit reports of the emotions experienced during the previous day, through the, though in less detail than the DRM. The gigantic samples allow extremely fine analysis, which have confirmed the importance of situational factors, physical health, and social contact, in experience while being not surprisingly a headache will make a person miserable and the second best predictor of the feelings of the day is whether a person did or did not have contacts with friends or relatives it is only a slight exaggeration to say that happiness is the experience of spending time with people you love and who who love you the gallup data permits a comparison of two aspects of well-being the well-being that people experience as they live as they live their lives and the judgment they make when they evaluate their life Gallup's life evaluation is measured by a question known as, known as the Cantrell Self-Anchoring Striving Scale. I don't know if it's central or Cantrell. I think it's Cantrell Self. Please imagine a ladder with steps numbered from 0 at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you and the bottom of the ladder represents the worst possible life for you. On which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand at this time? Oh, I think a nine or eight, maybe seven. I think I'm, I'm going to be honest. Seven, seven sounds really good. Nine is being extremely optimistic. Yeah, I think between yeah, seven being realistic and then six being pessimistic. So I think about seven. So I'll put that, that there. Uh, some aspects of life have more effect on the evaluation of one's life than on the experience of living, educational attainment is an example. More education is associated with higher evaluation of one's life, but not with the greater experience while being. Indeed, at least in the United States, the more educated tend to report higher stress. On the other hand, ill health has a much stronger adverse effect on experience while being than on life evaluation. Living with children also imposes a significant cost in the currency of daily feelings. Reports of stress and anger are common among parents, but the adverse effects of life evaluation are smaller. Religious participation also has relatively great to favorable impact on both positive affect and stress reduction than on life evaluation. Surprising, however, religion provides no reduction of feelings of depression or worry. Obviously, I mean, that's kind of obvious. An analyst of more than 450,000 response to Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, a daily survey of 1,000 Americans provide a surprisingly definite answer to the most frequently asked question and well-being research can money buy happiness the conclusion is that being poor makes one miserable and that being rich may enhance one's life satisfaction but does not on average improve the experience of well-being severe pro poverty amplifies the experience effects of other misfortunes of life in particular illness is much worse for the very poor than for those who are more comfortable a headache increases the proportion reporting sadness and worry from 19 percent to 38 percent for individuals in top two birth, top two thirds of the income distribution, the corresponding numbers for the poorest tenth are thirty eight percent and seventy percent, a higher baseline level and a much larger increase. Significant differences between the very poor and others are also found for the effects <coughs> of divorce and loneliness. Furthermore, the beneficial effects of the weekend of the weekend on experience while being are significantly smaller for the very poor than for the, for most everyone else. Than for most everyone else the satisfaction level beyond which experience while being no longer an increases was a household income above of about seventy five thousand dollars in high cost areas it could be less in areas where the cost of living is lower the average increase of experience while being while being associated with incomes beyond that level was precisely zero this is surprising because high income un, un, undoubtedly uh permits the purchase of many purchases uh sorry Permits the person. Blah, 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 sorry, blah, blah, excuse me. <clears throat> this is surprising because high income undoubtedly permits the purchase of many pleasures, including vacations and interesting places and opera tickets, as well as improved living environment. Why do these added pleasures not show up in reports of emotional experience? A plausible interpretation is that higher income is associated with reduced ability to enjoy the small pleasures of life. There is suggestive evidence in favor of this idea. Priming students with the idea of wealth reduces the pleasure their face expresses as they eat at a bar of chocolate. There is a clear contrast between 
the effects of income on experience, well-being and life and on life satisfaction. Higher income brings with a higher satisfaction, well beyond the point at which it ceases to have any positive effect on experience. The general conclusion is as clear for well-being as it was for colonoscopies. People's evaluations of their lives and their actual experience may be related, but they are also different. Life satisfaction is not a flawed measure of their experience while being. As I thought some years ago, it is something else entirely. Speaking of experience while being, the object of policy should be reduced to human suffering. We aim for a lower U index in society. Dealing with depression and extreme poverty should be a priority. The easiest way to increase happiness is to control your use of time. Facts. Can you find more time to do things you enjoy? Facts. Beyond the satisfaction level of income, you can buy more pleasurable experiences, but you will lose some of your ability to enjoy the less expensive ones. Okay, so that's a great, that is a great point. So the first thing is I want to talk about is the happiness thing <clears throat> and the satisfaction thing. Obviously, it seems he's correct about the idea that the more money you get, the less, uh, the other small things become less pleasurable. Okay, oh, sure, that's fine because... For instance, an upgrade is an upgrade, right? We don't really care about uh, after we get something better. That's just the facts. It's just the way life works. I mean, uh, that's, I wouldn't say that that's more very pseudo. I would say that's more our biology standpoint. We get something better and it kind of works out. I mean, because you, why would you go back down? That makes us think, okay, it's going down. Therefore we're going down. Our survival rate is going down. That does make sense. Uh, but the happiness thing is a very interesting question. So the satisfaction thing and the interest and the happiness thing is two different, th two different things. Okay, so he's talking about your well-being. Okay, the question is how much should you be happy and how much you must be satisfied. And the two things don't coincide. Okay, uh, basically I would say that... You should, he's like he said, to be happy, you should do, do more things that you like to do. And there's also a study about how people should actually be happy. From a happiness perspective, uh, people should spend more time with other people that they like and that they are interested in and that find interesting topics. If they don't, then it's just going to be very sad. From experience, I can agree with this. Um, the second thing is um, basically you know, going to nature, seeing a lot of greens, a lot of these, like when you're in cities, things go fast. So they usually say if time tends to slow down, I think this is, you know, from Andrew Huberman's, Andrew Huberman's podcast, he states that, you know, that time slows down when you're doing something that you like and if something you enjoy, which is an interesting thing. But also, I think that's just a very, it's a closed off argument because it's not fully uh, in description because I think, that there's been many times where things are going too slow, you know, where like, oh my God, this is dragging. This is taking forever, you know, and the, 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 the freaking seconds is going tick, tick, and it's like something bad. So I think there's a little bit of a misconception there. I don't know. I feel like there needs to be more research in that. But yes, I've, I've sensed with certain times that where I was happy, things can go really uh fast as well so it's a i don't think in that state that andrew human is correct in that but i think what tends to make you happy is good people around you you're eating extremely healthy uh not how extremely but like in the control sense of 80 20 where you're like you eat something and for emotional means that's pretty good kind of keeps you in a normal state if you keep on eating healthy 100 percent. i've seen people who eat amazingly healthy but they're kind of like they hate themselves um but I think, you know, enjoy the pleasures of life, but, you know, there should be a balance to these things. And I think that people should not go overboard with uh, pleasures. So there's that thing where we, if we get too, too much of something and it's there constantly, we kind of like diminish it, diminish its value. So the less you get it, the more it becomes important to you. And that becomes more interesting uh, to you as well. And you get a better feeling of maybe pleasure. Uh, the happiness thing is just keep on, you know, doing things that you like, keep on learning things about life, keep on giving, a, getting, getting new information about, uh, you know, you have to feel like you're kind of constantly going on a uh, journey of some sort. Maybe kind of, maybe I'm not there. Maybe I'm not there. Hold on. Like, uh, let's say 
what are, what happens when I feel happy? I think doing what I like and when plans come together and you know, uh, I think making I think what's also makes you kind of happy is when you see other people happy when you make them happy. That's an interesting thing. Also, uh, making other people you know doing kind things usually makes you, you happy. Um, what else? You, I, the qu to answer like the question like I think usually people get depressed because of like people in general you know they're like oh my life it's not like their life or they don't like me for this or and I think the question is maybe the case is that you should do what you like so other people follow in uh, to what you like doing so you inspire and then the people follow so that's the best way I could say is the best way of you know going towards that goal. I think also happiness as a goal shouldn't be the main goal. It should be, you know, a balance of things, pleasure, you know, for, yeah, everything, pleasure and happiness should be like, kind of like balanced. And that's my key thing. I, I think I've noticed that if you have any, if you have too much of something, that's always bad. It's always bad. If you have too little of something, that's also always bad. So going in that, finding that baseline is where I think you're, level of satisfaction and your level of happiness is where it will be, you know, um, attained. So yeah, that's the best way I can put it. Stay, uh, keep healthy, uh, make sure you help your family out, help the right people out, keep your goals attained, try things, try new things, try new experiences, you know, things like that. I don't like if you, there's another example of like if a base, if a guy who goes on the plane jumps on the plane 500 times, it's nothing to him. It's not scary. A person who does acting in theater does it a hundred times. It's not scary. He's done it multiple times in a repetitive way. So there's these things that show you that things diminish over time because you've done it multiple times. Less is more and it does make sense. Anyway, that's it guys. That's the last, uh, that's not the last chapter. 38 will be the last chapter. And then there's the conclusion, which means there's, Two more videos to go, and yeah, I'm so glad I've done this. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Your comments below, likes, subscribe, you know, the whole shebang. Enjoy, cheers.